It looks like the bombing of Gaza, which left over 2,000 people dead, ended only yesterday. One year since the last bomb fell, the people of Gaza continue to live in the ruins of their homes, their wounds and suffering just as present. During Operation Protective Edge, 11,000 people, one third of them children, were injured. They're not allowed to leave Gaza to get treatment. It is here on this strip of land where the economy has ground to a halt and there is no vision for the future that the people of Gaza struggle to survive. Bombs flattened the town of Betanun in the north of the Gaza Strip. Hadja lives here with her brother and her memories of their 20 relatives killed one summer evening in 2014. A year ago, 20-year-old Nadir was studying architecture. Mistaking the gas canister he was carrying for a weapon, Israeli soldiers shot at him and it exploded. Nadir suffered burns to his hands, arms, back and abdomen. I was studying architecture. I completed two years of studies, but I had to stop. I can't write, I can't draw, so I just stay at home doing nothing. MSF surgeons have operated on Nadir and Hadja is receiving physiotherapy treatment. The teams constantly hear similar stories from their other patients. We are going to, to treat a small child, five years old. He had been burned uh, ten days ago, almost, uh, on the arms and uh, on the back. So it's a cute uh, burn surgery. We have to remove the burn and uh, to place a new skin on it. Skin Whenever there's a lull in the conflict, Palestinians return to their daily lives and the humiliation and oppression they are subjected to daily in Gaza and the West Bank. Iman, who was injured during a bomb explosion, now wants to become a lawyer. I never wanted to advocate or speak out about what is really going on here. It's not easy for me to speak out, but now I have to. I want to deliver a message to everyone. We are suffering and we need help to stop the suffering. Eight-year-old children in Gaza have known nothing but the blockade since they were born. And they've already lived through four offensives, two of which were wholesale massacres. These repeated past experiences lead people to fear the imminence of yet more bloodshed. The Israeli government justifies its offensives as a response to violence. But this violence, which for decades has served as an alibi for a policy which is repressive and expansionist, cannot be legitimized. A year after the latest war in Gaza, we are no longer able to accept this alibi. We must take an even bigger stand for the people of Palestine. Working in Gaza for 15 years, Médecins Sans Frontières is witness to the intolerable impact the Israeli occupation has on the population. Humanitarian aid, which the people of Gaza so depend on for their survival, will not be enough to offer a future to the million children still living in bombed-out ruins. Crowded onto this ramshackle vessel are Eritreans, Somalis and Nigerians. They wanted to get to Europe to escape the violence raging in their countries. They wouldn't have made it if they'd stayed on their boat. The ship contains about 460 uh, people. It's very, very crowded. Uh, about 300 uh, of us in, we have in the boat and around the engine. So the engine is not working well. It's not able to cross the Mediterranean Sea by this boat. MSF has three ships patrolling the Mediterranean to rescue migrants. The teams provide them with first aid, as many have skin ailments or suffer from dehydration. There are also numerous pregnant women and people who sustained injuries during their journeys. 
By the beginning of July, MSF had already rescued over 5,500 people. But once on dry land, these people, who are desperately seeking a better future, often find that the only prospect open to them is being crowded into already saturated reception centres. Peacekeepers, deployed by the United Nations, were tasked with defending civilians taking refuge in the Srebrenica enclave that had been declared a security zone. But in July 1995, Srebrenica fell to Bosnian Serb forces, and 8,000 men over the age of 16 were massacred. Present throughout, MSF bore witness to these events and went on to challenge its own role in the enclave. When MSF started working in Srebrenica, it was all too obvious. 40,000 refugees crowded into a small village of 5,000 inhabitants under extremely harsh conditions. It was completely justified for MSF to be there. But now that we know how things played out, we obviously need to challenge MSF's contribution towards creating a kind of backdrop of security. And what we now know is that when the UN declares somewhere a security zone, it should not be taken as a guarantee, and as soon as it's possible to get out, grab the opportunity and go. Twenty years on, civilians trapped by conflict continue to live in enclaves under international protection, as in Central African Republic, or here in South Sudan, where the displaced civilians in this safe haven in Bentiu are not spared the violence that rages the other side of the barbed wire. Take this antiretroviral drug. Developed in a laboratory in the US and manufactured in India, it is being used in a hospital in South Africa. But getting there was a bumpy road. First, there's the patent. A new drug is generally patented for 10 to 20 years. During this time, it is meant to be marketed only by the laboratory that developed it and at a price they set in order to make returns on investment. But once the patent expires, the formulation becomes available to other laboratories, which can then manufacture a cheaper, generic version of the drug. Often, it is only then that medicines become affordable to developing countries. But 20 years isn't long enough for some laboratories looking to profit a while longer from the benefits of their patents. Some go as far as making just minor modifications to the formulation of their drugs or adding therapeutic indications in order to extend their patents. Another ploy, called data exclusivity, is applied to prevent generic drug manufacturers using the original laboratory's research findings. This forces them to conduct clinical trials on an already proven formulation all over again. It's time-consuming, costly and futile. But how to get around these obstacles when patients urgently need access to these essential drugs? One way is by opposing the granting of a patent. Take sofosbuvir, a drug used to treat hepatitis C. In France, a 12-week course of treatment costs €41,000, an eye-watering price for a molecule offering no innovation, according to aid agency Médecins du Monde, which has filed an opposition to the patent with the European Patent Office. Alternatively, there are international agreements that enable poorer countries to override patents when they consider that they run counter to patients' interests. Lastly, some countries have introduced legislation to push generic drugs onto the market, such as the case in Brazil, Thailand and India, among others. Indian law states that a drug's patent cannot be renewed unless it presents a substantial medical improvement. Consequently, India has now become the pharmacy for the developing world. The cost of HIV AIDS treatment is a good example. With the advent of generics, its price has dropped from $10,000 to $100 in less than 10 years. 
but several countries have in recent years set about trying to weaken the Indian legislation. Japan, the European Union and the US are using trade agreements in an attempt to protect their own pharmaceutical companies and their patents, to the detriment of the production of generic drugs. Médecins Sans Frontières has recently launched a campaign urging the Indian Prime Minister to stand strong and protect the manufacture of generic drugs. This is the only way to reach patients who depend on affordable drugs for their survival. Thanks to generic drugs produced in India, MSF is treating 200,000 people living with HIV AIDS, in addition to those suffering from tuberculosis, malaria and non-communicable diseases. Many more than the hundreds of thousands of sick patients receiving medical care from MSF will be affected by the threats hanging over India's patent law. J'ai plusieurs fois passé la ligne de front, donc cette frontière qui n'en est pas une. Euh, auparavant, le, les passages se faisaient euh, à différents endroits. Il y avait plusieurs points de passage. Les gens pouvaient traverser euh, avec, euh, en transport en commun. Depuis le 16 juin, un décret est passé qui aujourd'hui restreint ces, ces passages. Ça peut prendre plusieurs jours pour les gens pour traverser. Il y a beaucoup de personnes âgées qui ont besoin de rejoindre leur famille, avoir accès à leur compte en banque auquel ils n'ont plus accès euh, du côté euh, non gouvernemental ou ne serait simplement faire des courses euh, car les, les prix sont bien inférieurs du côté ukrainien par rapport au côté euh, non gouvernemental. Donc c'est difficile aujourd'hui de donner une, une vision globale de, des, des territoires euh, non gouvernementaux euh, ukrainiens. Euh, la situation est très différente, qu'on se trouve sur la ligne de front, qu'on soit dans une grande ville ou qu'on soit à la campagne. Euh, il y a des, des endroits qui ont été euh, partiellement, voire complètement détruits euh, par la guerre. Et aujourd'hui, euh, les matériaux de construction ne sont pas disponibles. Donc les gens habitent toujours euh, dans des maisons euh, qui n'ont plus de fenêtres, euh, ce qui était très compliqué euh, cet hiver. Et euh, on peut être à la campagne euh, où euh, on, est, on est capable de cultiver son jardin. Et donc aujourd'hui, les conditions de vie se sont améliorées. Et enfin, sur la ligne de front, aujourd'hui, il y a des gens qui habitent et qui ne peuvent pas se déplacer, notamment des personnes âgées, qui se trouvent dans des conditions presque cloîtrées chez eux et à des endroits où il y a des bombardements assez fréquents.